my my brother in Great Clips, mm. <laughs> the one, the only, the lovely, the talented, Sam Amick of The Athletic. Good morning, Samuel. Good morning, gentlemen. Did, did Domas get you to keep dropping all these Great Clip references, Dave? Is that what Do- happened? Domas? He's got a sponsorship with Great Clips. Oh, I didn't know that. Hey, yeah. hey. Yeah. well, then yeah. <laughs> even better. Now that Domas, Sam, myself. By the way, how do you and I not have sponsorships? Domas has. One. Let's go. Come That's on. right. Uh, here's a plug, kind of indirectly. I'll just plug the 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 company you work for. But during the break, and we'll get to this later. By the way, uh, Fabian Ardaya or Fabian Ardaya, uh, a baseball writer uh, for the Athletic. I was just. Uh, reading, he has uh, the latest on the Shohei Otani okay. uh, scandal going on right now, and there's a couple of rev- revelations in there that we sadly uh, and sorely uh, need to go over. But just illustrating, you know, your athletic subscription. Obviously, mm-hmm. we're talking to Sam. We're going to talk basketball during this interview. We're going to reference an interview that his colleague Anthony Slater had yep. with Malik Monk, and then you've got baseball. So uh, I'll do the plug at the beginning rather than the end. Hey, it's cheap. It's effective. It's great journalism. It's easy to curate what you want. I have a list of my favorite writers, so that way it shows up on the front page all the time. I only wrote one down. It was Sam, but still, I have I have that page, and uh, there you go, Sam. Pretty good. Did it right? I saw you took your glasses off. Yeah, I'm just going to go blind today. We're going blind. <laughs> uh, no, that was good. I, I'm sure your employers love all the free advertising you're giving out well, today. Appreciate well, you know, it. Hey, you know, we we, we got to work to try to get you on. Um, here's my first question. Yep. I want to talk about just about Anthony Slater's uh, article on Malik Monk. And we went over this yesterday. And I'm paraphrasing, but at the end of the article, Malik said something like, uh, you know, when asked by Anthony, do you want to, are you going to stay in Sacramento or do you want to? Monk said something like, you know, depends on the postseason. You know, I want to see how we do in the postseason, uh, but I love it here. The fans love me. I love the fans. Yada, yada, yada. I'd, I'd love to stay here. And Sam, I, I, I don't want to be drama guy. And it's like Malik has done everything but say, I'm staying here for sure. But help me out here. Anthony did a great job of going through mm-hmm. and laying out all the money parameters. Malik and his agent have known since the beginning of the year, uh, probably since before the year started, exactly what the Kings can offer, exactly what they can't offer. And the only unknown is what other teams will offer. So even based on what he just said, am I right to be incredibly worried that the Kings through no fault of their own, could very easily lose Malik if a Philly, if a San Antonio, somebody comes in with, you know, 20 a year and a guaranteed starting job, or am I being too dramatic? No, I don't. And, and I'll preface this by saying, you know, this is informed speculation, just like you. So I'm not, I don't want to make Kings fans freak out, but that calculus and the way you laid it out, I think is fair. Um, I, I, I do think, and I know it's been analyzed a lot uh, after that story came out, but there's a couple layers to it, right? Like the, the six man role and, and his, you know, candor regarding the fact that he doesn't like it, but he's willing to do it on this team. Like that factor matters. Cause he didn't outright say, I want to be a starter starting next year, no matter what. Right. But you know, but he, but, but it would have been better for Kings fans purposes. If he was like, Oh my God, I want to be the next, you know, Manu Ginobili, Andre right. Iguodala. He didn't say that. Um, the money stuff is a big deal. Because when you're talking about a deal where I think his next max uh, from the Kings, correct me if I'm wrong, but would be around 17. Yeah, um, 17.4, I think is what it was. Yeah, I mean, in today's NBA, for a guy that brings as much as he does, the, the market could very easily be above that. It just could. And then you have a guy who, considering, think about it this way, and this will probably make Kings fans feel even worse. Um, think about the way the beginning of his career went and a lot of the money that he left on the table during that stretch because he had his rookie scale deal. Now he's signing a minimum with the Lakers. Um, That's not, you know, the way a young player would like his financial career to go in the NBA. You know, ideally you sign a big deal after that rookie deal. So he's already behind the eight ball from that standpoint. And, And again, I know we're talking about a ton of money, no matter who it is. Sure. But so, yeah, I think it's fair to be a little worried. And I think the playoff comment that he made, lastly um is on point because i think for all of them it's going to be a fascinating off season to see where the mood is after the playoffs and by the way not to just keep going down the dark road 
they're playing pretty well lately. They just, I mean, I looked at it right now. It's like, they're right there on the play in like the, mm-hmm. the idea of them falling short of the playoffs is still a scenario that's in play. So a lot of stakes, um, you know, and, and he's an incredibly important player for what they do. On the list of things, it feels like Sam, the only thing that the Kings can tweak in their positive. I mean, they've got, they've got um, the lead, let's say, because he's here. He seems to like it here. He's played well here. He's one of the front runners, if not the front runner, to win a pretty prestigious award in the league. But the one thing that it feels like they can, I don't know if you could quote unquote promise, but what about that starting position? How much do you think that could move the needle? Because you're right. I mean, if Orlando, Detroit, uh, who is it, San Antonio, Philly yeah. offers that much more, and he already feels he's a little behind in the financial game. Missing out on one more year is kind of a big deal. So what do you think they could do in regards to that, and how much do you think that could move the needle for a guy like Malik Monk? I mean, it's I actually, just my opinion, I, I don't think that would move. I think that he's a smart enough basketball guy to know that I actually think in, in with this roster, he is best used off the bench. And I, and I think, you know, like the hypothetical that comes to mind is, you know, if the Kings front office went to Mike Brown and said, Hey, we got to have him, you know, be in the starting lineup. I think Mike, you know, would be concerned about what the ceiling would be for that group. Cause it's Malik's playmaking with the second unit, you know, because you're not always with Fox and Sabonis who are going to have that ball in their hands a ton. Like, I think you take away some of Malik's superpower if you put him in the backcourt alongside De'Aaron. And I think defensively, you would have issues now, you know, Kevin Herter obviously got hurt um, and was never considered a, an, an above average defender. Uh, but now with Keon Ellis and, and kind of what he's been able to do, like the defense remains an issue that they're trying to work on. I don't think Fox and Monk side by side. Um, I think the rest of the league would say, oh, that's great. You know, let's 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 attack the rim. And, and Fox has gotten a lot better on that end, too. But so I guess all I'm saying is it, it goes down to what Malik thinks of the Kings situation um, because I think they might take a step back if, if they put him in the starting lineup. And not necessarily, Sam, I'm not trying to counter what you said. I don't disagree with it. But but what gave me pause, and, and you referenced this, I've got the quote in front of me now from, from Anthony's article. When, when he asked Malik uh, about, uh, about starting and whether or not he enjoyed coming off the bench, Malik's quote was, hell no, hell no, I don't like it. But S word, it's what I got to do for us to win and play better. So I just take the role head on. Now, again, we can translate whatever. Maybe he's saying, yeah, I want to start, but hey, this is how I'm helping the team and I'm all for it. And it's not an issue. But man, you could also read that the other way of like, I'm doing this this year in a contract year. Because they took a chance on me and gave me the two-year, eighteen million dollar deal, but I ain't doing this next year. Uh, I'm either starting with my Kentucky guy in the backcourt, or I'm, you know, I, I I can start on a bunch of other teams. I just don't know which way to go with it. Yeah, I hear you, but I I think then it becomes a different conversation for the Kings, which is look at all the possible backcourt mates for De'Aaron Fox, and it, at that point it becomes, you know. Is let's say the market goes all the way up to, to 25, which would mm-hmm. be a ton. Yeah. Um, you know, is Malik Monk the ideal guy to give $25 million to a year for the Kings purposes? I don't know that he is. I, I just don't. I mean, my God, Slater had some good detail in the article uh, and it was a great story, but let's not forget like Mike Brown having to tell Malik Monk, Hey, you've played over a thousand minutes and you've never taken a charge. Like, <laughs> you know, that, like that part yeah. has gotten better. But um, it's, it's, you know, this is pro sports, right? Like we judge athletes a lot of times within the context of their contract. Brock Purdy is, you know, a success story because he's making $900,000. You know, when he's making 30 million, everybody's going to look at him differently. Malik is going to be in a similar boat. Um, And the Kings, I think, have to look at that because for this role, coming off the bench, being the spark plug, I know for a fact Mike Brown absolutely loves the fact, the way that he can bring him in with the closing lineup and show the opponent something late in the game that they haven't seen for most of the game, it gives them a unique wrinkle that he likes. Uh, and I think if it becomes about a starting uh, backcourt mate, then, 
I mean, they're, they're going to be somewhat limited in their ability to go get somebody else. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I think at that point, you might have to bring in a few more candidates to, to make sure that Malik is the guy. Sam, we've already mentioned a couple teams that do have money. It's going to turn out to be a pretty decent free agent summer. So kind of with that said, do you think there is a, a, a number of teams that would line up for Malik besides the Kings? I do. You know, Philadelphia is an interesting one because, um, you know, they they obviously made the James Harden trade. They've got a lot of assets and their strategy the entire time wasn't to strike right away and go replace James Harden. It was to take their time. Tyrese Maxey was going to have room to get better. Obviously, the Joel Embiid injury changed things for them, but it hasn't changed, I don't think, their summer which is that they're going to be star hunting yet again. They got Daryl Morey from, you know, the Rockets previously. That's what he does. Uh, they've been tied to Paul George, who has not got an extension done with the Clippers. You know, Malik, I think, would be in that similar category. Uh, hasn't accomplished as much as Paul, but like a dynamic scorer who could add something to a Sixers team where Joel needs more help. Um, so they come to mind. The one that, and, and, and again, clean this up for me, guys, if I – if I misspeak, but like, I, I think Orlando's interesting because they have money. Um, you know, they've been tied to Clay Thompson, who's going to be a free agent this summer, you know, conceivably that would, that would put them in the Malik Monk market as well. So, uh, you know, I think there are teams out there, you know, Orlando's fifth in the East right now, which quietly uh, nobody's really paying attention to. I looked at it today. They're a game behind like the Knicks. Everybody rightfully believes have had a really, really strong year and the Magic are like one game behind them. So Mm -hmm. a guy like Malik, you know, I could see Orlando being appealing, especially since he he appears to like the uh, kind of the small market, slow type vibe that that Sacramento has given him. So again, like Dave said at the top, I do think there is some reason for concern here. And can I just add, and I know none of us are cap honks, can I just add that you have exactly what the NBA should want you have a mid-market small market team that has built up uh largely through the draft even counting trading a draft asset for demontis Sabonis. it's just asinine to me that malik monk is part of the sacramento kings yet the king's hands are tied and other teams in a world where it seems like the golden state warriors and phoenix suns and la lakers can have a $400 million cap and and sign like three guys to a max deal. And the Kings are hamstrung on being able to re-sign one of their bench players and they can only give him $17 million. Sam, that just, I know I'm a, a purple glasses guy, but that just seems stinky. Yeah, I mean, I hear you, you know, and I wish okay. I had all the numbers in front of me, but it's like they, you know, they also made a choice to give a, a Brinks truck to Fox and a Brinks truck yeah. to Sabonis. And, you know, and if, if they had managed their money, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just giving you the reality. If they'd managed their money differently, I mean, they could have set it up in a way where, you know, if uh, they reach this point and Malik, now he's got, is it's an option for next year that he's opting out of, right? Or no? I thought it was a two-year, yeah, $18 two million year. Dollar deal. I could be wrong, uh, but I think that's right. it. Well, I mean, I, again, I mean, I guess, well, since I don't have the numbers in front of me, yeah. I won't argue with your premise. I, I mean, I get it. Um, it's not ideal, and it is going to require, I think, Malik feeling strongly enough about this situation to look beyond just the bottom line, and, and we'll have to wait and see if that happens. Sam, I know you've been uh, checking this team out. You mentioned earlier playing better. They are. Um, good month of March. They can't really shake free of in the standings at all, but some numbers suggest some improvement defensively. That's been an area that, probably has kept many to think that they can do anything. Um, But a lot of it seems like it's tied into someone people wouldn't expect, Keon Ellis, getting put into the lineup with the injury to Kevin Herter and just getting more minutes lately in the rotation. What do you think about what you're seeing from this team defensively? And are you you kind of buying that there's substantial improvement there? Yeah, it's funny. Right before we hopped on, Jay, you know, I, I I haven't looked at their defensive rating in a while and saw that it was 15th. And it's, I mean, that was the goal really coming into the year for Mike Brown and his staff was to be top half of the league. I mean, top 10 is something that that nobody would have expected or predicted given this roster. Top 15 is pretty good. The obvious 
you know, the only downside is that we didn't expect the offense to be 12th, um, you know, and, and it, but still, if you look at the defensive side, you give him credit for getting better. Keon, you know, he's just a, a scrappy, energetic, long, um, impactful player. And they, you know, I think rightfully realize that you spend most of the season with the offense not clicking like it had before. And the one part people forget <clears throat> is that offense in general just it obviously just went up again this season. The Kings are not as far off from their their kind of offensive rate of last season as people believe. They just have fallen down in the rankings cuz everybody else got better. But um I mean, especially with playoff time around the corner, the idea of having a guy like Keon who can hound perimeter scores and 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 attack the glass and and you know, spark the break and, and honestly has hunger because his career is on the line right here. This is a great opportunity for him. Um, I like it. You know, I think it's been a good move by Mike. And, and obviously it's been made a little, I mean, you feel terrible for Kevin, um, but they just went from feeling as if he was going to lose his job to Keon anyway, potentially to, you know, the injury um, cementing it for now. But, um, but, but it's great for them that they have a guy like Keon there. Uh, Sam Amick joining us from The Athletic. Sam, just a uh, mm-hmm. quick aside as we go around the NBA, I'm sure you at least are uh, tangentially aware of the uh, Grizzlies, Warriors, fracas last night, Draymond Green, I think Salty, uh, Santi Aldama, uh, Taylor Hawkins, uh, you know, kind of trips and goes to the floor. Looking at the replays, uh, I'm not going to ask you to predict Joe Dumars' brain, but is there a chance the NBA gets involved here and uh, as, as they have before the previous uh, altercations and incidents clause kicks in with Draymond and he might miss time. I mean, first of all, buddy, you just made Foo Fighters fans very sad because you have uh, a ah, thank you for <laughs> catching that. Uh, Taylor <laughs> Jenkins, sorry, <laughs> it's a miracle. He has come back as the coach, right? <laughs> Jeez, thank you for catching that. Okay, everything else but Taylor Jenkins, yes. Although, as another aside, uh, the Amick family got Foo Fighters tickets the other day, so we're, we're oh, nice. look, the, taking the whole fam. Uh, mom's not necessarily into it, the, mm. the, you know, but, uh, me and the boys are going to head down for sure. I'm sure she will be absolutely miserable having a night without all the boys, <laughs> uh, hanging out and doing, I'm sure she's just going to terribly miss it. Well, the other, I know I keep rambling on the side. The other hilarious part for me is it'll be about 18 hours. It's August 13th. It's about 18 hours after I get back from having been, uh, in Europe for 32 days. So I'm sure I'm going to be like, energetic and and ready to to rock so that'll be fun a couple quick things yeah number yeah. one that was a flex that was a really good solid like he flexed but like here's the thing he inserted the flex yeah into a very salient point he was right. making about a concert that we only got onto because i made a mistake <laughs> about a guy's name so that was like a level flexing right 32 days in europe i gotta imagine this is your sister and you're, you're doing the europe thing again probably we're doing it for a couple of weeks but then the family will fly home and uh and then it's off to cover the olympics so it's a combo trip we're just you, gonna keep flexing here dave yeah, another <laughs> great flex but not really because i asked and yeah. he's given a normal answer hey if you're over there and you want to see a preseason soccer match i got you Hey, let's go. You know, you just got to drive to uh, Yorkshire, northern England, about three and a half hours north of London, if you can do that. You can go go see York, Liverpool, uh, Manchester, and then stop in Old Huddersfield and watch a match. Is that well, now we're completely derailed. I'm going to hook you up with my sister who lives in Sheffield, buddy, because I don't think okay. that's that far from where you're talking about. Uh, no, I don't think so. But I'm married, Sam, as you know, and I have a wife. You've met her. Jeez. What is happening here? It's so awkward. Wow. Okay. Anyway. So Taylor Jenkins. Yes. Uh, Who said say Swift? <laughs> Dave Grohl came from the top rope. Um, Taylor Jenkins, you know, that's the only part where I think I wonder if the NBA might do something because. I actually thought the telecast, and if anybody didn't see it, you know, like Draymond and Salda, uh, Santi get, can't say his name. They get into it. Desmond Bain's the one who pushes yeah. Draymond, but it kind of doesn't matter. Right? You know, Draymond is the initial spark, like is the, is the case most of the time. Then, but I mean, Taylor hits the deck pretty hard and I guess was like holding his knee a little bit afterwards. 
you know, look like one of those I've fallen and I can't get up commercials. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so that's the part where from an NBA standpoint, when I saw it, my thought was even if he's fine, like, geez, man, the optics of, you know, a head yeah. coach trying to argue with the ref and he can't even argue with the ref without getting barreled over um, is not great. You know, Draymond seemed to calm it down pretty quickly and went back to Desmond Bain and said whatever he had to say to, to kind of end it. Um, the initial ref, I don't know who was standing right there. It was a mistake not to tee Draymond up initially when he's pushing, you know, Aldama the way that he did. Like, that's why the Grizzlies then felt the need to come back and say, we're not going to let you push our guy around. So sure. not a huge deal, but but not great. I know uh, the league won't do anything about this, but maybe the team will. Dave showed me the clip earlier. Should the Clippers <laughs> fine James Harden Jeez. for playing defense on offense if you saw the clip, Sam? <laughs> I didn't see it. What happened? Oh, my God. Are you serious? So both of us hadn't seen it. You had – Sam, shame on you. As a matter of fact, we're going to do something here. Sam, I need you to pull out your phone. Uh, just go on Twitter, open up Twitter, and just search in the search bar. Just search Harden. This is how you'll find it very easily. I need you to watch this live on the air so with this. his reaction. It's honestly one of the craziest things I've ever seen in the NBA. Um, I actually think it's the very top thing. Kevin DeGandhi posted it. I don't know if you see that or not. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with oh, you. Okay. <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> he claimed, you know, the team had been in a fog. He was trying to lift up spirits. Uh, he did not block Kawhi's shot. But he looked like he sure attempted to. Dude. <laughs> That's great. What is wrong with your guy, man? <laughs> I, I mean, and the tweet says it all, that it does look like a video game glitch where your fingers slip. <laughs> that worked out better than I thought, Dave. His reaction, what the? <laughs> like, that's why I don't like playing 2K um, is is because I'll be running down the court and I'll just start jumping, you know. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, is that the best defense James Harden's ever played? <laughs> I want to know, like on the on the NBA analytics, uh, is that uh, go in the category of like a Kawhi Leonard contested three? Yeah, and we, and, and we were talking about this too. Like, what if James had blocked it? Does he get the block? <laughs> yeah. Also, what if James blocked it in like the fifth row and just came down into the crotch, chopped it? Does he get teed? It? There's all kinds of fun <laughs> stuff here. I mean, jeez. Uh, Have you ever seen anything like that? Is there gambling in implications? Oh, right. Yeah, exactly. Well, that was the thing is that yeah. James Harden's interpreter had the under. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, he is a, uh, as I said before, I, 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 I respect the fact that he's a first ballot Hall of Famer, uh, and he is, and he should be. Um, I will, I will raise a glass of champagne when he retires. He is, I, he's just the most unethical basketball player I've ever seen in my life. Did you know this, Sam? Did you know James Harden actually has more free throws made than field goals? I did not. Yeah. There's your stat of the day. So anyways, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Did you know that, uh, Domas is going to break. How long is the record for double doubles? Uh, it's what 55 and he's at 53, well, I think. Or yeah. He's at 51. I think it's 53. 53 That's the you. modern era. But technically, Wilt has like 200. But and he was going up against, you know, let's be a Sears Roebuck stalker. Yeah. And, Why is it I mean, always the plumbers that take the shade? I know. I don't know. Why can't Sorry. be a roofer? Could or, be. Uh, uh, you know, one of the people that uh, the gutter Accountants. Accountants. Yes. Anyways, yeah. He's, An interpreter. <laughs> he's he's two off, Sam. But not an all-star. But why does Wilts not count? What am I missing here? I don't no, know. It's like it, the NBA ABA merge. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It should count, but all right. He's at like two twenty something. Yeah. I mean, I joked with somebody yesterday. I I took personal blame for Domas not getting on the all star team. If you remember that interview that we had, it like I published it I think three hours before the coaches votes uh deadline was supposed to be in. Um and I, I just look back at that. And I know I pivoted hard to Domas, but my God, the idea that this guy couldn't get on the all-star team is wild. Yeah. Oh, the cloud hair is going on now? Yeah, I'm, I'm wearing your hat, Sam, for publishing that article. I know. Um, you won't get that at Great Clips. He's, well, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not saying that the Wilt thing doesn't count, but Sabonis is more impressive. Like, dude, you're seven foot four playing in an age. He wasn't that. Or, or how seven one 
playing in an age where, like, I mean, has anybody ever looked at old clips? We talk about this of like Bob Cousy dribbling. I'm not gonna. I'm not sitting here for the wilt slander. I, I'm not. Is, is great. You, you, the fact that you just said that something he did is more impressive than wilt. I'm. I don't think I'm gonna let that fly. You, 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 you think that. I'm, I'm going to put it like this. If DeMontis Sabonis played in the era Wilt played, he would have, he would actually have 83 triple doubles in a, in a full year and 82 years. <laughs> two, like, I don't know. That's a whole, that's a whole different hour though, Sam, right? It so we'll, never, we'll never know the answer. Uh, it right. have a weird urge to have a, a, a snow cone. I don't know why. <laughs> Those are the best ones. The rainbow ones yeah. you used to get uh, after Little League, right? Sure. You, you guys have that? Sure. You go to the you go to the uh, you go to the snack bar after uh, your game and you get a snow cone. No, they didn't do that in Pleasanton. They do. They okay. do. All right. Uh, Sam do. Amick joining us. Uh, world traveling. Sam. Yes. Uh, just to recap, James Harden's a weirdo. Uh, Malik Monk may or may not come back. Sam's going to be in Europe for a month. Then go to the Foo Fighters. Watch that uh, jet lag, dude. It's a uh, it's a B. I know that's part of your life now, right? Part of my life, but I won't be I won't be covering the Olympics or nothing. But uh, good for you, dude. Somehow, oh, you're because you're going for the U- Team USA, right? Correct. Are you staying on a boat? Sherlock Holmes over here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all What's right. he staying at a at, at a at a place in uh in Lille? Because I don't know if you guys have heard the basketball is actually like two and a half hours away from Paris for most of the time. So I will get to uh-huh. know the. The, uh, the small town of Lille very well up oh. near Belgium. Okay. That's Sam Amick, uh, and he'll be doing live check-ins from Lille, France, and the uh, Olympics. We just closed that deal. Sam, appreciate you. Say hi to the fam. Talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank bye-bye. you. That's uh, Samuel Amick of The Athletic. Uh, we'll take a break when we come back. Uh, speaking of The Athletic, let's get into the Shohei Otani story again, and this thing just gets fished. This thing's so 